Okay. I'm surprised I don't have a video yet on placement persistency. I'm like, man, I'm I'm a bad boy because I did I haven't done one, and it's like, golly, oh, because someone was having a situation with a cancellation, and it's like, man, let's find a video on it because I've got almost 300 videos, and it's like, oh no, I don't have one. So this might serve as the placement persistency video for our team. Um, what is placement? What is persistency? Well, when you get a policy written up, it's not automatically issued right away it has to go through underwriting so the placement the term placement means that when you submit an application it's either placed or not placed when it's placed it gets issue paid and you get paid on it there are reasons for it not to be placed okay so placement okay is when it gets issue paid so the reasons for it not getting placed one it could be a decline where your client is not physically able to get into the policy because of their health height and weight whatever there's a lot of reasons um, uh, the, uh, something came up on the MIB that suggests that the person as it wasn't truthful with you on the application so declines the other ones are no takes in other words you get the policy issued and then the client decides they don't want it anymore and they cancel it like immediately they cancel it okay that's a that's called a no take they don't take it the other one number three is called a withdrawal where they you submit it it's getting underwritten they decide during the underwriting process that they want to withdraw the application okay so that's another form of a not place policy um, so those are the main three reasons why um, a policy um, oh there's another one NSF insufficient funds so they try to draft the clients account there's no money there they give the client a lot of opportunity to get the get the uh, policy paid up on the first you know um, and so it's NSF so it ends up being really a, a kind of another way of showing them showing you that they don't want to take it you know it's really kind of all part of the same thing they don't want the policy or they don't they get declined so these are typically the four reasons why a policy does not get placed now the part a lot of the stuff's in your control okay some of it is not but even some declines are in your control because a lot of times declines are based on you asking the questions properly um, with a little bit of um, strength asking questions very strong so when you're asking the health questions, um, prefacing the, the asking of the questions with, by the way, Joe, um, I'm going to ask you a number of health questions to determine if we can get this policy on you. Now, you know, you and I know that there's a big database on you out there called the MIB, and it has your health history. Anytime you've had insurance or applied for health insurance, life insurance, all, they know all your stuff in a da database. They know all the prescriptions you've taken over your life. They know every single thing about you. So it's real important that we answer these questions as accurate as possible. So if something's not on there, they don't think that, that you know, you're, you're trying to give them misinformation, okay, that you know, you're trying to hide something. We wouldn't want them to think you're trying to hide anything, right? Okay, in other words, you're telling them in a nice way not to lie their butts off, okay? You're telling them that, in order to get this issue, in order to get your family protected, we've got to make sure that we put everything on here that you know and remember about yourself, okay? Because they're just going to match up with what you say with what the database says. To include medications, you might have been prescribed a medication. Even though you didn't take it, it shows that you were prescribed the medication, okay? That shows up. So we got to really, Joe and Mary, we really got to be very thorough here so we can make sure that your family's protected. Right, so basically, you're telling them not to lie. <laughs> All right, and and you got to ask those questions a little bit harder. So, like the smoking question, another example is, when's the last time you smoked? Instead of, are you a smoker? When was the last time you smoked? Why don't you place that question with, when's the last time you smoked? Okay, when's the last time you had any kind of alcohol? You know, you know those kind of things. Uh, it's it's in the way that you ask the question, right? And you got to be thorough. Don't assume anything, you know. So, uh, and reestablish the height and weight. Make sure the height and weight is what it says on the lead. 
Sometimes the wife fills out the lead. She doesn't really know what her husband's height and weight is. She sort of approximates it, and it could be way off, right? So be very thorough in that regard. So those are things related to placement that, you know, the, the, the definition of placement, placing a policy, okay? So let's talk about persistency. What is persistency? Persistency. And Andy has some great videos on this on NA University as well. So, you know, definitely listen to Andy's. He, he defines it perfectly. But um, I, I just want to set up and preface this because I'm going to go into how you can increase your placement of persistency by huge amounts. It's like giving yourself a 10 to 20% raise just by implementing the things I'm going to recommend. But let's define persistency. Persistency is that the client keeps the policy, okay, so they keep it, okay? Ideally, to get ahead of the nine-month advance, we want to make sure they keep it at least nine months so that you don't get a charge back. Okay, that's the first objective. Objective. The second objective is to keep the policy forever, okay? All right, for as long as they can keep it, you know? Especially if you write with Alliance Life USA, you want to keep your ongoing renewal commissions, could be 5.5%, 6%, you know, seven, seven point five percent, whatever contract level you're at, forever for the life of the contract. If it's a whole life, it's forever for until that person dies, or when they cancel, or if they cancel the contract twenty years from now, or ten years from now, on a whole life, or a term for the entire length of the term that they keep the policy. So, our objective is to make sure that we satisfy them and help them keep that policy it just makes good business sense okay so I'm going to show you tips on how to increase your placement of persistency so nine months now if you get if they cancel like in month number four that means you get charged back five months because your advance is basically nine months of your commissions on the nine months of ex uh, expected premium payments so you're going to get advanced nine months up front if they cancel at month number four, you owe them back five. If they cancel at month number seven, you owe them back two. If they cancel at month number one, you owe them back eight months of commissions, okay? So that's how chargebacks work. I don't like chargebacks. Chargebacks are not fun. And chargebacks really uh, – now, there will be chargebacks, okay? So let me tell you what um, placement and persistency targets ought to be for you, okay? We call it P&P. Your target is 90%. In other words, you place 90%, and 90% of your policies are still in force at the end of nine months, and I like to say at the end of 12 months, all right? Because 12 months, you get the rest of your commission, because months number 10, 11, and 12, you get paid up front nine months, and then months 10, 11, and 12, you get paid as earned. So your commission on their monthly payment gets paid out at months 10, 11, 12. So after one year, you get paid all of the commissions coming to you. Um, like if you're place a thousand dollar policy, fifty five percent commission rate at the end of twelve months. If they kept their policy for twelve months, you should have five hundred fifty dollars. Okay, seventy five percent of that five fifty would have been paid to you up front, and then ten, eleven, twelve are paid fifty five percent of their premium payment, fifty five percent of eighty two, eighty three dollars a month. Boom, boom, boom then you get all of it at the end of 12 months. So really 90% at the end of the year should be there, okay? Because it's just the way it is. It, the, you can't beat the numbers, numbers can't beat you, but you're gonna have a certain level of like, you know, in the, in the grocery industry, we call it spoilage, right? Or we, uh, as if I were in it, you know, the, the, gro the grocery store my, in my house is the refrigerator, but you have like 10%, what is it? I forgot, whatever, it's like spoilage. Right, so you can't get out of it. But look, we got people at a fifty percent placement, you know, maybe sixty percent persistency. Man, that sucks. They're not making any money. The overall average in NAA placement is about seventy-five percent, and persistency is seventy-five percent. It's roughly the average. But Alex, I'm, you know, I'm doing seventy-five percent. I'm doing pretty good. It's like, bro, you could do better because. I have agents that get 90% on each. So learning place and persistency, that's a 15% raise right there. And typically these 90% people are people that write a lot of policies. 
So it's not just the lucky ones that happen to get a good family member. You know, we, we measure these and we know that the top, the prolific producers are, are doing that. So you can do it too, right? It's a 15% raise. Here's the other thing about an average, a 75% average. There are people doing less than that, right? So if our top people are doing that, then there's people doing less than that, which means they're not making any money. They end up quitting because it sucks going out there. You spend half an hour going to an appointment. You spend an hour, hour and a half with them getting it put together. And then you come back home half an hour, what, two, three, three and a half hours, and then it gets withdrawn, declined. Man, it, it's like frustrating. If that happens a lot, then you get, it sucks, okay? I know because it happened to me where mine was really bad. So I'm going to share with you the things that I did to turn it around. And some of our top people, like Mr. Paul Epstein, he's been with us seven, eight years. And there was a period of time one, two years, three years into the business where his placement persistency was terrible. It almost took him out of the business. And then he spent an hour on the phone with me and immediately it turned around. And he's still in the business. He'll tell you, he credits that time he spent with me on the phone to get his placement persistency. Mike Levin Thomas didn't know what to do. So I said, Alex, you got to talk to him. I think he's going to quit. So I said, Paul, dude, what's up? And I got them on the right track. So hopefully these things I'm going to share with you are going to help you get on the right track. All right? So the sale's not a sale until they've kept that policy for 12 months. Okay? <laughs> right? The deal is closed. You know, you think that you, uh, you married your wife, okay, or your husband on wedding day, and after you, you know, consummated on the honeymoon, you think, okay, man, I'm married. Everything's cool. No, no, gang, you're not married until you say today you wake up and she's still with you or he's still with you. You, you know, it's a daily thing. So place and persistency in your business, it's a daily thing. It's what you have to incorporate in your habits of doing things, all right? So let's start with the process. You close the sale, okay? You go over the last page, okay, and – so you close it, then you go into the post-sale mode, okay? And the post-sale mode is where everything starts to happen. So this is the post-sale process in more detail than I cover in my ATM video, all right? This is the last phase in the process, locking down your sale. So you close the sale by getting an app signed or an e-app signed. You collect a check or you got the money situation where the draft's done and avoid a check. You get you, 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 Tap all the pages, tap all the pages together so it's all one little thing. And you think by going out the house, you're done. No, you aren't, okay? Because the post-sales process begins here, all right? So the first step in the post-sale process is what I call pre-deliver pre -deliver the policy. Now, what do I mean? I wish I had a policy um, somewhere close by. Um, Okay, so what do we mean by pre-deliver the policy? Here's what you do is you pull out, um, that's probably in the car. Well, let's just say these. I should be more prepared, I know. Oh, well, I'll just use our old activity book. Okay, so what you do is you say, oh, by the way, Joe, let me show you what your policy is going to look like when you receive it. All right, so you pull out of your bag, you pull out your policy, you say, here's mine. I want to show you what mine looks like. Why do you want to show them yours instead of a thing that says specimen? Okay, well, when you see specimen, specimen reminds you of a urine specimen. Okay, it just kind of conjures up. It's just specimen policy. It just sounds yucky. All right, I'd rather put mine up that has my name on it. I say, Joe and Mary, look, this is my policy. Let me show you what mine looks like. So I open mine up. I say, okay, you see here where you see all the benefits that I have for my family, the death benefit, the disability, the return of premium, the waiver of premium. See all these benefits? Your, yours is going to look just like this. I, I, gang, I don't care if your policies with um, Foresters and you're selling on Mutual of Omaha. All the policies look the same because by law they're required to look very similar. There's like a boilerplate format that they're required to, to um, use to print a policy out for the client. So you see my name here, your name's going to go right there. And you see all these benefits? The, the benefit that you chose today goes right here. And you, you'll see your annual premium 
rate for each one of these benefits. You see how that is? Yours is going to look just like this. Okay, and then you go to the page. You see this page on your payments? Now, remember, you bought a 30-year policy, so you see how your premiums are level all the way to 30 years. Now, you see this here where it says um, after 30 years, it goes up. This is the maximum that it can go up if you want to keep the policy going. Like, for example, if you're terminally ill at the end of your policy, you want to keep that um, policy going, you have the option to take that all the way up to age 100 or 95 or whatever. So that's the maximum they can charge you per year for that. Now, I know it looks crazy. <laughs> it looks like, you know, it goes up 10 times, but that's the maximum. Typically, in my experience, Joe and Mary, that if you have to renew it, it may not go up more than like maybe 10, 15 percent. It doesn't go up by that much, but it, they have to show you by law how much they could charge you if the world started falling and we have the zombie apocalypse and everyone was getting eaten, turning into zombies, and that's what it would be, okay? But it just shows you you have the option to extend it all the way to age 100 or 95, whatever the case may be, all right? Okay, now you see here um, the death benefit. Um, or the uh, suicide exclusion. So you see here in the suicide exclusion, if you're going to ever kill yourself, the best time to kill yourself is after two years. Okay, so don't commit suicide until two years and one day. Okay, so then the policy will pay out. I, I'm laughing with them. You know, it's kind of a joke, but it's true. They'll pay for a suicide after two years. And then you see this incontestable, be, incontestable period here for the two years it means that if you die within two years, it may take a little bit longer to get the death benefit back, okay, to you because they're going to look into it and make sure that everything's kosher with the way you passed away versus the application on here, okay? Does that make sense? But you, it's a, after two years, they don't care, okay? Um, in the case of an accidental death, um, they'll just pay it. Not a big deal. They're not going to really research into it because it's an accident, okay? So that's there. Okay, now here's the page that speaks about the riders. So my rider, you see my rider on disability, explains that. You're going to have that same rider that you purchased on disability or whatever the rider they purchased. It's going to look like this. It'll explain it in detail, how to access the benefits if you need it. It'll be right here, okay? Now this next section shows you how the death benefits paid. It can be paid out lump sum. It can be paid out in the form of monthly payments. You've your beneficiary, Mary, you have the option on Joe's policy to, to get paid out however you want, and it's all tax-free. And then finally, at the end, at the end of the policy here, it, it, there's a copy of the application, so you'll be able to exactly see what we filled out here today, all right? Here, why don't you hold on to it? This is what it's going to look at, look look like. And I give it to them, and they do the waka waka waka, waka waka waka. Okay, they they feel it, they touch it. Okay, the the kinesthetic people out there that want to touch and feel something, this means something to them. They touch something that's going to be a real life product of the conversation you've had for the last hour, hour and a half. So what you've done is you you've created a conceptual sale of protecting their families into something real, something that is they're going to receive. That is a contract that says this is what you're going to get. This company is going to back it up with this contract. Isn't that cool? That alone will get them fired up because they get to feel and touch something. It's not this ethereal, you know, cloud of concept that they just are paying $82 a month for. So it's the pre-deliver process that locks it down and gets them fired up, all right? Now, number two, you've got to protect the sale. So you've got to go in protection mode, okay? Sometimes those leads are not pulled out. The lead that you sold isn't pulled out quick enough. And let's say you've had that, and maybe it's an A1 lead. And maybe the guy that had his an A1 A lead is trying to call them. Or it could be a, a, another company that that person sent leads to or filled out the lead form, and it's another agency, another company that calls on them. You have to protect the sales. So you say, hey, Joe, Mary, by the way, are you happy with what I've done for you today? Are you happy with um, the process? Are you happy with the policy? Um, is there anything that I need to know that I did not satisfy or that you're, you know, are unsure of? Oh, and hopefully they're going to say, well, yeah, everything's great, man. We just really appreciate you coming out. Everything's awesome. And, um, okay, I just want to make sure... Now, you know that sometimes you fill out a lot of these different forms. When you fill this out, I'm sure you probably filled out more than one of these, right? Say, well, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, and, um, and our company likes to be thorough, so maybe another agent from our company might even call on you 
to set up another appointment. Can you do me a favor? If you're completely satisfied with what I've done for you, can you please tell any of the people that call to, to try to whistle their way in here and try to force their way in your home? Just let them know that you've already taken care of it and you took care of it with me. <laughs> All right, and that you're not interested in sitting down. And, and let me tell you, Joe and Mary, these salespeople are aggressive. They're going to weasel every possible way. They're going to tell you, I can get you a cheaper rate. I can get you this. I can get you that. They're going to promise the world just to get inside your house. Okay. Now, I just want to make sure that when they call, it, you're not going to want them to come in and try to, you know, mess, it up, mess you all up with the protection I believe is the best for you. Does that make sense? So, Joe, when someone calls in, is, is that something that you think would be reasonable to do? I'm telling you what, gang, you've got to protect yourself because some Tom Dick or Harry agent is going to come in and try to, to do the Jedi mind trick. I am coming over to your house. I'm going to replace that policy with something that is worse. Okay? They're going to do the Jedi mind trick on them. They're going to get in there and replace your policy, and that totally sucks with an exclamation point. So you got to protect your sale. And it could be another NAA agent. Don't think that all NAA agents are like us in our team. <laughs> all right? Okay. So anyway, protect your sale. And here's what I believe. They're not your client. If they're going to let another agent come in, you think you have a client. You have a client when they, when they say, no, don't come over. We already took care of it. I know. It's the the objection that you hate hearing. Well, Dad, damn it, the reason why you're hearing it on the older leases is because that agent did their job capturing that client as a client. Does that make sense? They're like, man, they hate your client until they stay with you and they don't let any other agent come in. You are their servicing agent forever, right? So you got to protect the sale. Okay, so part of the process is you're going to tell them that you're going to call them back in two days. Tell them, call back two days. In other words, you say, okay, Joe Mary, I just won't. Yeah. Alex, this is Chris in Minneapolis. Is that, is that uh, what you just mentioned, is that actually, is that legal to do that for another agent to come along in that re rescission period or whoever may be to actually try to pull business away from you? Is there any legality to ask to that? It, you're, by law, by insurance commissioner, you're not you're never to replace a policy that's better than what you that's can what, offer them. That's that's what I thought. So if another and then a agent offers them a policy that's probably that can be nearly as good as the one that, that you just you just sold them, then I mean I, there's obviously a lot of unethical issue there, but it isn't enough. There's all, there's also probably possibly some Ill, illegality because they can't come in and replace the policy if it's not give me a better policy in the first place. Dude, dude, that's like calling a ball and strike. It's like the batter looks at the ump says, that was a ball. And the ump says, no, that was a strike. You can get, look, in my 15 years, dude, I've yeah. had, never had anyone claim foul and go to the insurance commissioner and have legal action taken against an agent that's replacing a policy. No kidding. Really? I mean, look, there's the practical side, there's the theory, and then there's the practice. Okay. Now, I, I would get pretty upset. Like, for example, how how I things I've seen done is an agent comes in and writes them as a non-smoker when they're really a smoker. I've seen okay. that done because I've gone into homes where a guy sold them a non-smoking policy when they're really a smoker. When I see that stuff, even though I can, you know, I will I will go to town on it. I'll say, Joe, Mary, do you know that policy? When they find out that you're really a smoker, they're not going to honor that policy. Exactly. Uh, that, that agent totally lied to you, and right now you're in trouble as far as getting the coverage you're looking for. Um, you know, I'm sorry that you had to go through this, but, man, I can help you, but... You know, and then you go into it, and then you replace it. And then what I typically do, even if, especially if it's an agent, is I will call foresters. I, I bypass their upline. I'll call foresters. Hey, foresters, this agent wrote this client as a non-smoker. You need to put him on your watch list because I sat down with him, and he's really a smoker. So I, I call foul on him, and I, I don't even talk to their upline. I'll say, 
hey, upline, your client, your agent did this. Okay. 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 So I don't mess around with that. So anytime you run in a situation like that, you call me and then, you know, we get them in trouble. So I have no problem getting them in trouble. And even if it's another agent with another company. All right. So, and, that, and, that brings a, and that brings up a good point because if, if there's if there's other companies out there that have nothing to do with that are their competition to NAA or, or all of us, then I can understand we can't really control their actions. But it's it'd be, it would be frustrating if you've got Joe Blow who's also a new agent or, or even a veteran agent with NAA, and he happens to for, you know go into that customer's house that I just kept in a close two or three weeks ago and try to promise him the moon when I know dang well I already gave him a great policy and tries to overpromise him and he puts out a good sales pitch. The customers, you know, they obviously, you know, I, I completely agree with you. It's not really a customer of yours until they, they you know, until they actually real, believe it and, they, and the policy goes through. Whereas if they try to, you know, believe, you know, believe the other agent and tries to throw a bunch of sunshine at their tail and they believe it, I guess, is there any recourse at all if the, if the agent already closed the customer and they know that was another NAA agent of ours? You, you'd think they'd have the they have some integrity to back off from that from that. Well, but it, it, well, we try to we try to work it out. So I'm not going to go into detail with that dude because this is way too. Okay, okay. so we'll we'll try to work out with them. We'll try to you know. But here's the other thing. Like if you walk out of there and you place the term policy and everything's cool and but another agent comes in and writes some another policy, like a whole life policy that you didn't take care of, then as far as I'm concerned, that's all legit. I agree. Yeah, I agree. So you, in that you, case, you, it's still you, not yeah. your client. And then if they came in and wrote an annuity on them and you didn't do it, they're still not your client, and that's all legit. All right, so anyway, let's back off that because I'm running out of time, and if you have any other questions, let's talk another time, all right? All right. Uh, all right. Okay, so you tell them you're going to call back two days later. So you say, Joe, Mary, if you've got any questions, okay, I'm going to call you back two days later, and I want to answer those questions, okay? And so guess what? You tell them you're going to call them back, and then you actually, hey, Chris, can you put your phone on mute because I hear a lot of noise. Actually, you call them back. In other words, you tell them you're going to call back in two days, then you really call them back. And you say, hey, Joe, Mary, this is Alex. I just want to make sure I promise you I'll call you back in two days. Remember, trust is created by fulfilling, fulfilling promises. You call them back, and I just want to make sure that everything's cool. You got any questions for me? Okay, now what are you really looking for? Are you really calling back to answer questions? Absolutely, but you're really wanting, wanting to find is that hesitation on the phone. When you say, I'm going to... This is Alex, I, I promise I'd call you back any questions. Then you hear this hesitation. Then in your mind, you're going, okay, this, I'm going to hear it. And then you're going to hear this. Well, Alex, uh, Mary and I, we were thinking. Okay, and then dot, dot, dot. Well, we think it's too expensive. We think it's not our budget. Think blah, blah, blah. And I go, you know what? Absolutely. I, you know, when I walked out of there, I was kind of feeling a little bit like maybe. Um, so here's, I've got some time tonight. I, I think I can be at your house about 8.30. Let's talk about it. Let's see if we can look at something that might be a little bit better because I've got a lot of options. Remember, I, I laid out three options, and you pick option two. Let's look at variations of option one that you know might be a little bit better for you. All right? So um, I'll be there in about half an hour, okay? And let's talk about it. Gang, okay, you've got to do this. Buyer's remorse sets in after two days. You can have a chance to go back in there and save your policy, but I promise you, a week later, two weeks later, when you call them up, hey, Joe Mary, got your policy fired up. I'm going to deliver it to you. When's a good time to come over? And they say, Alex, we decided we don't want it. But the problem is you let two weeks go by, and you don't have any chance to go back because they made their decision solid. Time kills all deals. So they spent two weeks solidifying the decision by putting it on a shelf, closing the door, and never revisiting that decision again. So when you call back two weeks later to deliver the policy, it's done, gang. It ain't, it's over. But you have two days after they made the decision to come back and talk to them. Right? You got two days, man. Two days. And you can go back and save your policies. You really call them back. You don't just tell them that just to sound like a a good salesperson, you actually do it so you are a good salesperson. Does that make sense? All right, so you actually do that. Um, okay, number five, we had the great, this one agent did this. You send them a card or a note in the mail. 
actually a missive. <laughs> These call missives, a letter or something. No saying, hey Joe, it was great to meet you and Mary. I'm happy to serve you as your life insurance agent, Alex. You don't thank them for the business because does your doctor send you a thank you card? Thank you for coming over and letting me diagnose you. Thank you for letting me do a, a whatever procedure on you. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed getting your, your urine specimen. <laughs> they don't send you a thank you card. Why should they? They served you. You were going to them to fix your problem, and they helped you. You should be thanking them. Likewise, your clients will thank you. They should be thanking you because you provide them a service to protect their families, gang. Okay? So you don't send a thank you card. You send a card note saying, hey, man, it was great meeting you guys. Uh, it's my honor to serve you as your life insurance agent. Just call me anytime, day or night. I'm, I'll be there to help you. When you send, take your Lexus into the Lexus dealership or your Chevy into the Chevy dealership, what I love about their service departments is you actually get a call saying, hey, just following up. It's that two-day call. Hey, just following up. Were you satisfied with everything? Or you get a little card. I love those because most people don't do it. And that's what differentiates you. Most agents won't do this stuff. Even NA agents, most of them won't do this stuff. But you're the one that separates yourself out. Do you think someone else is going to be able to come in their house after you've done all of this, card and note, saying, hey, I'm happy to serve you. Let me know if there's anything you need or if you have any questions. A little thing that you hand wrote, not a form letter, but you wrote it. All right? Number six, if you have a longer case that takes more than a couple days to get issued, I do the touch base calls. Okay, so if it's taking longer than a week, I, every week, this is every week. I was actually very good at getting um, fully underwritten issue pay because I did this part. But if you have a case that's taking a little bit longer than expected, then you touch base with them every week saying, hey, Joe and Mary, just want, this is Alex, just want to let you know that everything's progressing. Okay? You may not have heard anything. I haven't heard anything. But as soon as I hear something, I'll let you know. You can either leave a voicemail. You can send them an email. You can call them up. As long as you – what I used to do back in the days, I used to send them letters. I send a letter every week, every week, every week. Because back then it took two weeks or a week to get a policy issued, even on a simplified issue. So I'd make sure they got a, a, a touch base call or voicemail or whatever every week that it was in underwriting. So that's another way to lock that down so they know what's going on. Okay, number seven, personally deliver. Yes, you can have the policy sent to them. You can have the policy sent to you, and then you deliver it. I'm a big fan of you going over there. And if it's in the mail and they, they receive it, I tell them, or if it's going to go in the mail and they're going to get it via, you know, post office, I say, Joe, Mary, look, next couple weeks you're going to get your policy in the mail. I want you to call me and let me know that you got it because I want to schedule the time to come over for about 10 minutes and go over it with you. I want to open it up with you, all right? And so this – Personally delivering is exactly the same as the pre-deliver. Everything you did in the pre-deliver, you do with their policy. Do you see how you kind of connect the dots? You know, dot, 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 dot. You come back to here, it's like, oh, hark, this is exactly what you told me before. Again, trust is fulfilling a promise. So you pre-deliver, then you deliver the policy, you lock down, you close the loop, everything is tight. It's like tight, like Lego blocks, gang, personally delivering it. And you do exactly the same thing you did there before, opening it up with them. It's like a Christmas gift. only takes five, ten minutes. But then you lock that down again. You can maybe start getting more referrals, or you can leave them growth without risk, or you can do all the other things to get the sale after the sale. That's the pre-deliver. Then number eight, annual review. Every year you call them up. You may not have to go over there. Maybe they don't want you to come over. But every year you call them, hey, Joe and Mary, it's Alex. This is a year later. You stick it in your phone, your calendar, your electronic calendar, and you lock it in every year. Anniversary date of Joe and Mary's policy. Give them a call. You put their phone number in your calendar and then repeat every year. So every year that lead comes up because it's a lead. There's an opportunity to serve them again, potentially. And you call them, they'll say, hey, Joe, Mary, this is Alex. Just saying a review. I wanted to call and just see how things are going with you. 
Um, any changes in your family situation, where you live, anything I need to know about, any changes in your health? Well, as a matter of fact, there's, you know, we've got some other questions. We think we need some more. Okay, great. Let me schedule you in. Alex, you don't need to come over. Nothing's changed. We're pretty happy with everything. Pretty happy? Oh, yeah, yeah. We're, we're happy with everything. Everything's going great. Okay, cool. I'll call you next year, same time. See, trust is delivering on that promise. Every year you call them up. Every year. And I promise you, when you come out, when they want you to come over, half the time you go over to do an annual review, you're going to write something else. I promise you. That's, those are our numbers. All right? So, gang, that is how you get your placement persistency up to 90% because you follow through on the post-sale process. You lock it down. You pre-deliver the policy. You, you protect the sale by protecting it from other agents calling them. Then you protect the sale by doing all these other things. You tell them you're going to call back in two days. You actually call them back in two days. You send them a card or note that you hand writ, wrote. You, you touch base calls every week if it's underwriting is taking longer than a week. You personally deliver the policy and you call them to do any reviews every year. Gang, this is the formula. This is the secret to being a professional in this business. This is how you make a ton of money on the effort that you're already expending. This is how you raise your your income by 15, 20%, honestly. And actually, it's more than that because the sales that you're going to get from being having a loyal client, man, just cannot be even be estimated, okay? So I hope that makes sense. Um, does anyone have any questions? I think you hit star six to unmute. Let me uh, see if anybody has any questions. Oh, man, I didn't mean to go this long. So let's unmute. Mute. Hey, Alex Abian. Yes. Hey, Jimmy Valley here. Hey, hey Jimmy. Jimmy. Hey, uh, before the call is over, if there's a few questions, I've got a real cool story I'd like to maybe leave everybody with if, if there's maybe two minutes left. Yeah. Okay, well, um, let's, let's cover any other questions related to what I just talked about, then I'd love to hear your story. Anybody cool. got any questions about this process? Okay, do it and make a lot of money. All right, Jimmy, lay it on us, man. So uh, this is Jimmy Valley, hired by Core Goodson, and you know I wanted to I wanted to just reach out to some of the new people and the part timers out there because that's what I am. Um, and I want to just tell you a cool story about what happened to me yesterday, which man, it's just it really tells you how cool this opportunity is, and also the importance of asking for referrals. So considering I have a full-time job, I'm going to give you a quick rundown of my week. And uh, Alex, I'm sorry to get my numbers in. Um, I got home super late last night. <clears throat> That's all right. So let's see. I picked up the phone Tuesday. I had a couple leads come in. I dialed for 30 minutes at my office. I made seven calls, four contacts, and set up two appointments. One appointment was Tuesday, one was Wednesday. So, again, I don't have a ton of time in this because of the other jobs. I met my customer Tuesday, had some questions that I, that I really wanted to get answered before I felt comfortable moving forward, so rescheduled him again for Wednesday. Yesterday, I get to his house at 4 o'clock, had all my questions answered. We wrote the policy, final extent, about an $85 premium, so... I felt really great. I thought, nice, that's awesome. We helped somebody. Uh, it's a good product. And at the very end, you know, I said, you know, uh, keep me in mind, you know, if, if you have any friends or family who may not have enough insurance or none at all, call me. I'd love to help. Love the opportunity. Well, he yells across the room. There's a lady in the living room. This is his sister. He says, Fanny, how much insurance do you have? She comes walking over. She says, I don't have any insurance. <laughs> so the gentleman comes and said, well, Fanny, you're not leaving me with that bill if something happens to you. The insurance man is here. You need to talk to him. So I, I looked up at Fanny. I said, hey, I'm here to help Jesse today. We've got that handled. He's covered. Um, if, if you're more comfortable, I can come back another time. I don't want to put you on the spot. She said, no, I've put this off long enough. Let's talk about it. So they changed positions at the table. Anyway, we wrote her a policy. There's also a young girl running around the house. 
asking me a question. Hey, is that your wife in the picture? How long have you been married? Really nice girl. She's 11. So I looked up at Fanny. I said, hey, uh, has she got a birthday coming up? She said, no, it's not until March of next year. I said, well, look, the best present you can ever give her is one of these policies for Mutual of Omaha, and I slid her the, the children's card. I said, it's five bucks a month. It'll be the best thing you ever did for us. She says, you know what? I want that too. So anyway, so now I'm sitting there. I've got three policies. Meanwhile, Jesse is on the phone with his other sister who lives two streets over. The doorbell rings. In comes sister number two. Hey, you, you're right. You're an insurance man? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, well, uh, what can you do for me? <laughs> and I am just blown away at this moment. I said, well, sit down. Let's talk about it. My, my other appointment was at um, 6 o'clock. Yeah, there's yeah. no way I could make it. However, I said, well, I've got to help this family out here. Long story short, one lead off those few dials. I wrote five policies, and the total was 3626 yesterday. Do you think you got your return on investment on that cost of all those leads? Oh, my gosh. And, it's you know, Alex, I know I hadn't talked to you since then back, and I just recently set up a GMR. Uh, last week, I wrote 2900 and some change. My lead bill was $64. And uh, this week, I've got about three, four hours in it so far. And, you know, yes, the return of premium is fantastic. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. Dude, you rock, bro. I always knew you had it in you. I always knew you had this in you. It just took a little bit of time, right? Timing. Timing is everything, isn't it? That is so true. And, you know, Cords pushed me, and he's, he's laid back, and he didn't push too hard. You know, he just said, hey, man, just know when you're ready, we're here. Any questions? And uh, I went to enough hot spots and watching people I hired outdo me, and that's all I needed to see. I said, uh-uh. Nope, we will change that. So, you know, and I do prefer to lead by example. So I want to go out there and do these things and, and do the right things. That way I can, if I'm going to duplicate myself, I really want to do it the right way. Oh, my gosh. You give me goosebumps, bro. In fact, you know what? I talked just a couple of days ago to Patty's nephew. So I'm already too deep under you, under Patty. Your business is growing and um, on the recruiting side, but you're growing. And, you know, that's, That's one thing, gang. When you hire somebody, don't push them to the point they want to quit and never see you again. You've always been nice to Jimmy. You know, whenever Jimmy came around, hey, Jimmy, you know, and then maybe he'd kind of get distracted or he just had the life going on. And then all of a sudden, now it's time, man. And he's stepping up. And, uh, you know, it's like when I heard Scott Struthers' name, you know, I was so happy that he kind of got into a thing that he loved doing in a, in a ministry serial standpoint and then hear his voice on the call it's like oh wait this is so you know again prodigal son but you know what everyone's welcome here and no one's judging anybody look i have life gets in the way i try not to let distract me but i get distracted too you know but andy all right always hugs me with open arms and knows my failings and you know if we can't forgive each other then, then that's a, it's a sorry world because you've got to forgive yourself first and then know that we're not here to judge you. So there's nothing to forgive. It's like, man, we're proud of you, man, and you're setting a great example. And that's the way our team rolls, gang. We don't judge anybody other than, you know, are they meeting their goals and what do they need to do to make their goals happen? So, dude, that was an awesome story. I love it. I loved it. And, um, man. Well, let's end on that note. And David Howell, um, I want you to talk about your thing. Let's see if we talk about your thing next week on um, how you systematically put door knocks together and door knock and lead. So, anyway, gang, proud of y'all. Let's rock and roll this week, man. You just got me fired up. I got goosebumps, Jimmy. Proud of you, bro. Thank you, sir. All right, man. Take care, gang. God bless. Bye now.